Hallelujah. I'm glad to be back with you guys. I've been away for a while. I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord with my family, my people, my Patterson family. Amen. And uh, man, we were um, driving up here today and, and it was a couple of detours. Anybody house get flooded? Now I got a couple of people back in Baton Rouge. And uh, we're cleaning up their houses. Uh, Grace Larson is one, and it's yeah. a couple, Brother Bob. Uh, he has a couple houses that were doing it that got flooded. And we were in there, we were tearing down all the sheetrock and um, the wall and everything and taking out the nails. And there were some people that went there before us, and they were helping them out, I guess, when I was in New Jersey. They were helping them cut everything out, but they left the nails in there. So... Usually when you do it, it's better to go through and just break down and get the nails as you're doing it. Because then when we, we're going back over it and we're trying not to miss everything, trying not to miss the nails. But if you leave those nails in there, it's going to make it harder for when we put the new sheet rock in there and put the new wall up. It's going to make it harder. It's going to be a struggle to get it right. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes with the Lord, when he's doing the work in our hearts, we just want it to be quick and easy. Yeah. Yeah. And we just want him to come in and just cut it out and keep it simple. But if he doesn't go and take those nails out, Amen. it's going to be harder and it's going to hinder what he wants to do to make you new, to, to make you brand new, to bring, you know, make sure there's no mold, that there's nothing left behind that can affect you down the road. And the yeah. Lord, he's so faithful. He doesn't miss anything. But sometimes we try to let him not take out the nails that need to be taken out. And I don't know, but when I was doing the, taking the nails out and I was just working on that wall and the Lord was like, Nine, let me take it all out the first time that I don't have to go back a second time and right. redo it. Let me do a complete and finish working you. And that's what the Lord is saying tonight. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's turn in our Bibles to the, uh, the book of James. Amen. The book of James. Pastor Matt was talking about it even before I came up here. He was talking about tests and trials. Tests and trials. And in the book of James, it talks about that in chapter 1. He's talking about the trials. It's, uh, some of the titles that he gives is Victory Faith. And it's so funny. He gave the title Victory when it talks about in verse 2. It says, Brother, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into uh, diverse temptations. And he titled that Victory. You would think that's not victory. That's trials and pain and struggles. <laughs> Where do you see the victory in that, James? But James was saying there's victory in that because when you count it joy, then God can give you the victory over that circumstance. He can give you the victory over that trial in your life. And Pastor Matt brought that up. But I want to look at verses 19. James 1, chapter, James chapter 1, verses 19. And uh, in some of the book, it, uh, it says, doers not hearers only. Can we be that? Can we be that church? Can we be doers of the word and not hearers only? Amen. Can I pray? Lord, I thank you. Thank you for this time. I thank you for this word, God, that you've given us tonight, God. God, I pray that Holy Spirit, you would make us hearers of the word, oh God, and not only that, but we would be doers of your word, God. God, you're desiring a people, God, that you can take us further, God, than just hearing the truth, but Lord, walking it out day to day, God, living it, God, in those places where no one else knows and no one else sees, God, but we would choose to be a doer, oh God, and I ask that you would anoint me now, oh God, and bless the people, God, that we might hear your word, I thank you and I praise you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Verses 19, it says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And as I was writing in my notes, I said, you know, we always are quick to say, I preach Christ and him crucified. I preach the cross. I preach the truth. But can we be the ones that say, I live the truth and I walk it out and I'm a doer of the truth. I'm a, I, I'm, not only do I preach it, but I walk out Christ and him crucified. And that's what the Holy Spirit is challenging us tonight. Let it not just be something we know, but it would be something we walk out. Christ and Him crucified. Yeah. And there's no pressure in that. There's no, there's no like, whoa, I have to struggle to make this come. I have to be a Christian. I have to, a Christianity living. Because you're not, it's not, you're not walking out Naya's message in your own strength. But you're walking out Christ and Him crucified. He's already done the work. Yeah. It doesn't say Naya and me crucified. But it says 
Christ and him crucified and what he's done. And we can walk that out. And um, James talks about all these things, temptations and everything. But then he says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let us be swift to hear, quick to hear. And I wrote in my notes, I was just laughing at myself. I said, well, I said, I said, um, saints of God, if we are speaking, we're not hearing. And it says, uh, and I, I put there, I said, I, I don't always have to be the one to get the last word. Amen. I don't always, we don't always have to be the one to get the last word across to our husbands or our wives or our friends or, or our coworkers. We don't always have to be the one. But if we're speaking, how can the Holy Spirit speak to us? If I'm always before him and I'm coming to him and I'm murmuring and complaining and I'm saying, Lord, this and that and all that. And yes, the Lord wants to hear. He does. He cares about every single one of you personally. I don't know what's going on in your life, but he does. And he sees everything and he cares about it. But we have to also be at a point where we can be quiet. It's so funny. I was talking to Angie's mom and we were talking and she said she was practicing at a time. Uh, she was getting counseling. She was practicing, and it, they said, practice doing this. <laughs> and when she did it, I said, wow, that's so simple. She said, hey, just find yourself just like this. <laughs> you know how some people, you can just rest your hand there, but it helps keep your mouth closed. <laughs> and it's kind of made me think of kindergartens when you would teach <laughs> kindergartens. You would say, quiet, and the teacher would go like this. Uh, and then everybody, until, and, and she won't say a word to every kid, and they're like, oh, shh, shh. And, and then they can hear the instructions of what the teacher desires them to do. And I feel like sometimes with the Lord, I, we just need to go. Yeah. <laughs> so we can hear the instructions of what he wants us to do. Because he's speaking and he's giving us direction and he's leading us. But if I'm constantly running my mouth, I cannot hear what God wants to say to me. And I know that's so simple, but it's so profound because... And I, I think it's interesting, it says, swift to hear, slow to speak, and then slow to wrath. Because I said, Lord, why did you put wrath? Why did you say slow to wrath? And I realized he said slow to wrath is because sometimes when we run our mouths, we get ourselves yes. worked up, right? Da -da -da -da, and we get so fired up and we get worked up. And next thing you know, we go from we go from five to a hundred just like that because we're running our mouths and then we don't even realize what we're doing. But this whole monster comes out and his anger comes out, but we hyped ourselves up. It was like the lawnmower. You just kept pumping that thing up and then it gets going. And next thing you know, you're cutting up everything and tearing up everything, bringing, dis bringing destruction. So he said, slow, he said, swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. And then verse 20, it says, for the wrath of men worketh not the righteousness of God. I mean, the word of God is so simple. It's so, he, he, he gives us this word and it speaks so clearly. We can never miss it. We can never miss it. We just open up the word. He says, the wrath of men worketh not his righteousness. And sometimes we feel like if we put our own oomph into it, if I just get my own hands into it, I'll make this thing happen. It doesn't produce righteousness. It produces harm. It produces everything besides righteousness. That God and our, our anger, I, I feel like sometimes we feel like if I just get in there and I just make this thing happen and I just tear this up and it's just going to get done. And then after we do it, it's like, but it didn't have to go that direction. It didn't have to go that way. I didn't have to make that mistake I did. But because I wasn't allowing myself to submit to God's righteousness, submit to him to allow his glory to be done. Verses 21, it says, it says, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save us, save your soul. And right away when I read that, I said, yeah, you know, we can't be in filthiness. We can't be in naughtiness. We shouldn't be sinning. But sometimes we just stop there. He said, lay aside. He said to lay apart. That means to lay it aside. I wrote my notes. It says to put it away, to cast it off. And filthiness, dirty, cheap. Uh, superfluity means uh, abundance of naughtiness. To lay it aside. And if we choose to lay it aside, but don't stop there after you lay it aside. Grab a hold of what Jesus has made available for you. A lot of times we try in our own strength. I'm going to be righteous. I'm going to live a holy life. I'm going to put this thing off. 
but yet we don't grab a hold of what he's made available. Don't stop and just land it at the altar. I love that song it was saying, come to the altar, you know, in your presence. And it was saying these things, and, and it's, the altar is wonderful, and the altar is amazing, but a lot of times I believe as Christians or just humans in general, when we see there needs to be a change, we acknowledge it, we see it, and we push it away, but then we don't grab a hold of something else. We need to grab a hold of Jesus. We need to grab a hold of what he's made available. And he said, receive it. Take it. Take it. Receive it with meekness. Be humble. And it says the engrafted word. And I was thinking about that too, engraft stuff. We have um, back at home in New Jersey, I got to go see it just recently. And I got to see my mom and dad. And uh, uh, we had these fruit trees growing up. We had an apple, um, pear, and peach. And man, these trees were a struggle growing up all, but it was so funny as we were growing up, they would bring fruit, but it wasn't very good. It just didn't taste very good. But every day after school, I would go pick an apple or a peach or something. I would eat that thing as I'm walking up to my house and it never really tastes good and different things. But there are some people that take their fruit trees and they, they start to graft, like they, they make a split between an apple and a pear and they start to do the work. The reason why our trees weren't really producing much we never cut them, we never tended to them, we never took care of them, we really didn't. The deer would come and eat them up, and that was it, and we would just, my grandfather, um, he's passed away, but he actually one year came out and he made an apple pie and a peach pie, and it was actually really good. But he knew what he was doing. But anyhow, it says the engrafted word. When you engraft another plant into another plant, it produces like this hyper, it's like, it's, it's, it's a whole nother, how can I say, a DNA. A whole other thing that comes from. And when the, we allow the Holy Spirit to take the word of God and, and engraft it into our hearts. Right. He can produce a whole nother character. He That's can produce a whole nother life. And if you ever watch a video of it when they do it, they literally know what they do. When they come into the old tree, they cut it a piece away. They take it away and they take it from another tree. And they place it in there. They wrap it up tight. And then after a while, it begins to grow and it produces. And actually, sometimes it helps other trees and they start to produce better fruit than what they were before. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to engraft the word of God in, in our hearts that we might produce fruit. Yeah. What's that? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, meekness. Yeah. And that's what the Lord is wanting to give us. He said, look, I'm going to take all this filthiness. All this, it says filthiness, it says naughtiness, all this trash, and I'm going to take it away if you surrender it and lay it down, and I'm going to give you the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to give you, I'm going to engraft it into your, into your heart. And I just can see a picture of that. The Word of God taking root in our hearts and producing fruit and producing life. And it says, I love this, it says, which is able to save your soul? Which is able to save your soul? Does your soul need saving tonight from the things of this world? Does your soul need saving from your own self? Does your soul need saving from these trials and the things that the enemy will send our way to bring destruction? Then grab a hold in meekness and let the Holy Spirit engraft his word into your heart tonight. It says, but you, but in verse 22 it says, but be ye doers of the word. And not hearers only, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Sometimes, you know, I even thought myself, we can think, just because I'm hearing it, just because I'm in church, and just because I'm taking part of it, that, that automatically makes me okay with God, or automatically makes me right. He doesn't want us to stop there, though. Don't just stop with just sitting here Sunday, Wednesday, or whatever activity but also be a doer of it. And how do we be a doer of it? We believe, we believe faith. You know, for every action, for every action, there's a reaction. When I place my faith in the Lord and I choose to believe in him and I trust him, he will give me the strength to go and to walk it out, to walk it out. Amen. And he desires that. And I desire, I know you guys desire, I know it's your heart's cry, that we just won't talk about the things of the Lord, but we would be doers of the right. Lord. How else will anyone be able to see Jesus Amen. if they don't come to church? Amen. How else will anyone be able to come to know him if they don't see us living it out day to day? Amen. Amen. That's right. 
And, it, and it's funny how he said, uh, deceive not yourselves. We deceive ourselves. We think, oh, I know Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> or we say, I know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And we deceive ourselves to think that it's just okay and that's all we need. Don't deceive yourselves tonight. Don't deceive myself. And I praise the Lord that he will show us the truth. In verse 23, it says, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding himself, natural face, in a glass. In verse 24, For he beholds himself, and goes his way, and straight away from forgets what manner of man he was. Verse 25, it says, Behold, it says, But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forget, uh, sorry, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. I love that verse 25, it says, the perfect law of liberty. Are you working, are you walking in the perfect law of liberty tonight? It's a perfect law. It's a perfect law. It's not the law of the world. In verses 14, it says this. It says, but every man is tempted, and when he draws away on his own lust and intent, in verse 15, it says, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Right. Verse 16, it says, do not, it says, do not err, my beloved brother. That's a law in itself. That's a law right there, but if we choose to believe in the perfect law, what is the perfect law? The perfect law is that I am a sinner, and Jesus Christ came down, and he died on the cross, and he paid the penalty, penalty for me, and he rose again, and he conquered death, and he conquered hell. And now, because I choose to believe in him, and I place my faith in him by faith, now he will give me the grace and the power to walk this thing yes. out. That is the perfect law of liberty. That is the perfect law. That is what we have. That is what we have made ourselves one with. That is our covenant. That is the yes. new covenant. That is the perfect law. So when we talk about things, we can say, "Man, she's talking about doing, doing, doing." But I'm here to tell you the answer to doing and living this thing out is to keep in our eyes and our hearts and our minds set on the perfect law. He said, "But whosoever." He said, whoso looks unto the perfect law, they will be able to do these deeds. Yeah. They will be able to walk in victory if we keep our eyes on the perfect law. And in that verse up there in verse 14, it says, basically, the wages of sin produces death. Yep. It says, sin when it's finished with you. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. It's not when you're finished with sin, but when sin is finished with you. It's not when you you choose to, to stop, but, but when the, the, you know, so many times we think that we're in control of our struggles, we're in control of our sins, I can dibble and dabble in this, and I'm the one controlling it. And I said this to Pastor Matt the other day, I've seen someone that uh, uh, they started messing with drugs and different things, and in the beginning, they still have their strength. Right. Yeah. But I haven't seen them for a long time, and when I seen them again, I said, wow. It took their strength, it took it all. And when you looked at them, they were broken and they weren't the same man that I seen before. And they thought they were controlling it, but now it controls them. Yes. And he lost his control over it completely before he was able to control it and still look outwardly that he had it together. But when sin is finished with you, it brings death. We can't play with it because you can't control it. I can't control my sins. I can't control it. And I cannot act like I have control because it is the one controlling me. Amen. That's right. Beloved, can I say to you tonight, don't play with it. I don't know what it is. I don't know who I'm talking to, but don't play with it. Yeah, because it will be finished with you and it will bring forth death. But if you choose to look at the cross, and if we choose to say, I want to be one that looks to the liberties which Christ has made available for me when he died on Calvary, then he will give us the grace to walk this thing out. Amen. He will give us the grace to walk it out. And in verse 26, it says, and if any man among you seem to be religious, and bridle not his tongue, but deceives his own heart. 
This man is religious and vain. Man, look, I'm just reading the word of God. The word of God, the word of God is talking. It's saying it. I'm not saying it. And I'm speaking this to my own heart. I'm speaking this to me. I'm not speaking it down on you, but I'm speaking it to me because I believe with all my heart, God wants us to be a church of people because he's coming back and he's looking for a bride who has oil in their lip. He's coming back for a bride that is made ready and he's coming back for a bride, a bride that is white and without spot and blemish. And that's what he's saying, church. He's saying, I need a bride that is about my father's business. I need a bride that is doing the work of the Lord. And that's what he's challenging us tonight. And I, I pray to God that we would be that church. Right. We would be that church made and ready. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He said, if a man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart and this man's religious is in vain. Mm. I don't want to be that man today. I don't want to have a form of godliness and lack the power thereof today. I don't want to be that. And I know y'all don't want to be that. I know that is our heart's desire. So I'm just reminding you of what the word, that we will not be in vain. Lord, and we pray this all the time. Lord, don't let my work be in vain. Every time we're driving here from um, Baton Rouge and we're serving, Lord, don't let my work be in vain, Lord, because I can come and do and all this, but it will be in vain and it will profit in nothing. Verse 26, it says, pure religion and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit the fatherless and the widow and their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So James takes us on this whole whirlwind and then he ends it with this pure religion. You know, I was talking about it at work. We were saying the word religion now is a, it's a word looked down when people say, you know, he's religious and he believes the Lord. We're like, no, I'm not religious, it's a relationship. Yes, Amen. yes it is. Amen, it is a relationship. But there's a pure religion that is that the Lord has designed his people to be at. There is a pure religion. And, and we were talking about how, you know, if it wasn't for the Lord, I would not be moral. If it wasn't for the Lord, I would not care about not drinking or different things and all that. And that's not what it's all about. But if I wasn't saved, I wouldn't care about those things. There is a there is a level of uh, morality that the Lord produces in the body of Christ. Amen. And he's looking for a pure religion. And what is that pure religion? You would think it would go to works. But he, he amazes me when he says this. A pure religion and an undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widow in their afflictions and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Lord help us. Would we be that? Would we be the church? Would we allow the Lord to visit the fatherless and the widow? That shows me a, a life that's not all about me, a life that's not all about what I need, what I need, what I need all the time, but to visit the fatherless and the widow and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Victory in everyday life is living, which again, must have to help. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can't do this. We can't. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, all this stuff that I just read is impossible. It is impossible, but I praise God that he wants to empower us. He wants to give us power. You know, before I knew the message of the cross, I would read this and I would start to think about all the stuff I got to do and I would work up on how I can get this done and I would give myself a list of how to figure it out and I would go and do it, but it had no power because I was doing it in my own strength. I was like in, in the verse when he was talking about a man looking in the mirror, I would see my flaws. You know, when you look in the mirror, I, I know ladies, we get in the mirror, we start picking our face and maybe guys too, and we see all our blemishes, right? And we're like, oh man, that's so ugly, that's so messed up, I need to fix that. And we stare and we pick, but then as soon as we leave the mirror, we forget about it. And that's what he said. He said, you become like a man who says, who beholds their face in a glass. And but when we walk away, we forget about it. But if we look to the perfect, the law of liberty, 
The Holy Spirit is not going to let you forget about it. The Holy Spirit is not going to stop messing with you. He's going to keep saying, Naya, would you let me deal with this? Naya, would you let me give you the grace? Would you let me give you the power to walk this thing out? Would you let me give you the power to do this? Would you let me give you the power to uh, not move in wrath? Would you give? Would you let me give you the power? And so that's why we have to go and look to the perfect law. Because all we do is when we look at ourselves, we just pick everything apart. And we say, I'm going to change this. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm trying not to do that. I'm going to do that. And as soon as we leave, man, next thing you know, we're just running our mouth again like that mode. It's just going to town. But when we look to the perfect law of liberty, liberty, then he will give us the grace and empower us to walk it out. It's a law. It's a law. It's, it really is. It's, it's, it's not the law that I'm talking about, like, you know, but it's a law. It, yeah. And saying that it's a principle that yeah. will happen. This will happen. The Holy Spirit is saying, if you do this, this will happen. And that's the word of God tonight. Yeah. That's the word of God. Can we look at Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verses 4? Ephesians 5, verses 4. Ephesians 5, it says, Neither filthiness nor foolishness, it says, talking nor gesture, which are not um, convenient, but rather giving of thanks. But rather giving of thanks. And it right there is showing you the opposite. And because when he was talking about filthiness and naughtiness, and, but a giver of thanks, because it's not convenient. It's not convenient for our lives. It's not convenient. But yet, when we're so worked up and we're so caught in it and we're holding on to it, we find ourselves in a position of foolish, foolish talking, foolish talking gestures, which are not convenient for the Christian. It's okay. It might be okay for the other Jews at the job that aren't saved to talk, which is not okay. But for them, but because you are not like the world and you're separate and God is calling you to another direction then it's not convenient for you it's not convenient for me but rather give thanks Amen. and I, I, I just want to challenge you for that when you find yourself in a position and you find yourself and it's just chaotic try it just try it one time instead of turning to foolish talk try giving thanks yes. I just want to just challenge you that this week that's coming up when we find ourselves and, and anger and, and running crazy and chaotic and all these things, just try it. Start to give thanks. Yes, Start to give thanks. Start to thank the Lord for what he's done. Start Because then you're placing your eyes off of that garbage and you begin to place your eyes on the cross and you begin to place your eyes on what he's done. And I'm telling you, it would begin to change tremendously. It's going to change your life tremendously because you're going to turn from that and you're going to find yourself, you know what, Lord? This situation is not convenient for my flesh right now. This, this, this trial. God, but I thank you. I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you care for me. I thank you that you have my best interest out for me. And I trust you. When we begin to trust him, we begin to do the things that we were created for. Yeah. When we begin to trust him and we count it as if he's in control and he has everything in, in his hands, we don't have to fret anymore. And then we can be the ones that he created us to be. Because when we're not trusting him, we're walking in fear and doubt and unbelief, and we're not being all that God has called us to be. Amen. We're not living all that God has called us to live. We're not moving as God has called us to move. We're not speaking the way as God has called us to speak. But when we trust him, we begin to do the things that he created us to do. What did he create you to do? What is it that he's called you to do, beloved? You know, this church, our church here, we, we are all called. God has called every single one of us, and he's given every single one of you a, a ministry. Yes. What is that? What is that? And maybe we find ourselves running from it, and maybe we find ourselves not entering into it, because then it, it, it calls us to a place where we have to let go of filthiness. We have to let go of our own desires, 
and grab a hold, and, and it hurts. He has to begin to cut our heart to engraft the word of God into it. It's a painful, it's a painful uh, process. Amen. But the fruit that it produces and the life that it gives is worth it. Yeah. And he wants to increase you guys tonight. And I just want to encourage you. I know this was a lot, but I believe that the Lord is calling us as a church <coughs> to not only be hearers, the doers of the word. Yeah. Amen. He's calling us. And I, I, you know, it's been a crazy year, the last couple of years and whatnot, and uh, the, the COVID and everything that's going on. And like uh, Pastor Matt was saying, so many different things everybody's been going through. But he's calling us, church, to another level, another step, a deeper walk. And I believe once we start being doers of the word, that, you know, it's just going to be abundance of blessing, abundance of blessing, because we're not walking after death and it's not producing death, but we're walking after the law of liberty, which produces life. Yeah. And it gives you power. It gives you power. Do you need power tonight? Yeah. I need power to walk right. I need power to, to talk right. I need power to live right. We were watching a video. Uh, some lady said, I need the grace of God. I need Jesus to walk into Walmart. We need the grace of God to live every day. Yeah. Every day. There's a song, and it came in my, and, uh, came to my mind when we were driving up here. And uh, it's called Going Up to the High Places. Have you guys ever heard it before? It's like, it's an old school. We used to sing it a cappella in our church, and it's like, <clears throat> I'm going to try to do it right. We had this one lady. Uh, she was like my grandmother. Her name was Carolyn Ross. And um, she's, her issues uh, was cross. Because Carolyn and then Ross. And she was like, yeah, I'm all about the cross. <laughs> and I mean, this lady is a big old black lady. I mean, she's this big lady. And this deep voice, strong voice. And she would come into chapel. And we would all be down. And, you know, it'd be a midday week. And she would come in there. She'd walk in and grab that mic. She'd be like, going up to the high. Going up to the high places, going up to the high places to tear the devil's kingdom down. Yeah, and she would go, listen, she would say, listen, you got to be bold, you got to be strong, we're going to tear the devil's kingdom down. And then she would say, you got to take back everything the devil stole, we're going to tear the devil's kingdom down. And she would go, we're going Yeah. 
No more, not in our marriages. No more, not in our children's life. No more, no more, no more. And you've got to be bold. You've got to be strong. You're going to tear the devil's kingdom down. Hallelujah. We're going to be doers, not just hearers. Look out, Patterson, here we come. Look out, church, get ready. 